Welcome to The Real News, I'm Kim Brown. On April 22nd, 1970, over 20 million activists across the United States participated in the first ever Earth Day. It was before the environmental movement focused on climate change. Instead, it focused on issues such as ecological overshoot, water and air pollution, and unbridled economic growth. The first Earth Day came just months after the Santa Barbara offshore oil spill in California, the largest in U.S. history at the time. Although it took a massive level of grassroots organizing to pull it off, the movement also had a major leader inside of the halls of power. His name was Gaylord Nelson. He was a U.S. Senator, a Wisconsin Democrat, and he had visited the Santa Barbara oil spill site in its aftermath. Inspired by the anti-Vietnam War teach-ins at the time and concerned about the lack of congressional action on environmental issues, Nelson created a nonprofit called the Environmental Teach-In Incorporated. Nelson's advocacy eventually took a life of its own through grassroots organizing and came to be known as Earth Day. And here to talk about this history and connect it to the present is Tia Nelson. She is the daughter of the late Gaylord Nelson, the former senator. Um, Tia is the managing director of the Outrider Foundation's climate program, and she has served as the executive secretary of the Board of Commissioners of Public Lands in Wisconsin from 2004 through 2015. She was the director of the Global Climate Change Initiative at the Nature Conservancy for 17 years as well. She joins us today from Washington, D.C. area. Tia, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here and uh, help uh, tell the story of the first Earth Day. So Tia, we are 50 years removed since the first Earth Day. Can you share with us what you remember about that day in 1970? So, um, I'm often asked what my first memories of uh, Earth Day are. I was in junior high school in the D.C. metropolitan area going to Kensington, what was then called Kensington Junior High, and I was picking up trash on the school grounds. Um, and I don't, you know, I didn't have a sense of the significance of the event at that time. What kind of an imprint did it lead, leave on you, especially at that time, I mean, it was sort of grooming you to be a future activist. Well, I was very, you know, I, I adored my father. He and I were very close at a very young age. I became interested in what he was doing and I had a sense that he was doing something important. I certainly had a strong sense that uh, he that public service was an honorable calling. He served in the United States Senate with Bobby Kennedy. Um, uh, they were seatmates, um, and uh, I had this big crush on Bobby. I begged my father to let me go to the uh, Senate with him when I didn't have school, and I'd open mail in his office in the morning and, and go over and um, uh, see Bobby in the afternoon. And I, I certainly had a sense that he was doing really important things, but I don't think I recognized the significance of Earth Day until probably the, the decade old uh, anniversary in 1980. Uh, and of course, it was a surprise to my father. His original idea was an environmental teach-in uh, call to action to teachers across the country to set aside a day to teach on the environment. He hoped through youth engagement and activism uh, that he uh, could uh, shake uh, Washington out of its lethargy and get it talking about what he thought were the most important issues of the time. And it was successful beyond his wildest dreams. So Walter Cronkite, the, the veteran legendary broadcaster, described those participating in the first Earth Day in a way that a lot of environmentalists or environmental activists are described present day as mostly white and affluent. Let's listen to what Walter Cronkite had to say. By one measurement, Earth Day failed. It did not unite. It did attract that broad cross-section of America that sponsors wanted, not quite. Its demonstrators were predominantly young, predominantly white, predominantly anti-Nixon. Often its protests appeared frivolous, its protesters curiously carefree. 
But in a 1970 speech given by your father at the time, um, this is before the first Earth Day in Milwaukee, Senator Nelson pointed to the connection between waging war in Southeast Asia and pollution within America's inner cities. And our goal is not just an environment of clean air and water and scenic beauty while forgetting about the worst environments in America, in the ghettos, in the Appalachians, and elsewhere. Our goal is an environment of decency, quality, and mutual respect for all human beings and all other living, living creatures. An environment without ugliness, without ghettos, without poverty, without discrimination, without hunger, and without war. So this sounds like the paradigm that we see today as environmental justice or climate justice. So can you explain what Senator Nelson was trying to convey here and what he meant when he called ecology a big science in that same speech? Well, I, I love that. Um, thank you for mentioning that. I love that. Uh, uh, speech and that clip is included in a film that the Outrider Foundation has produced with youth activists Varshini Prakash and uh, Republican uh, climate change uh, advocate Bob Inglis. Um, my father said ecology is a big science, not a narrow science. It includes the worst environments in America, in the inner city and in Appalachia. I found a print version of that speech in a bookshelf here in my mother's house uh, where we're sequestered like millions of Americans uh, uh, and billions of people around the world. Um, the print version says, uh, it, uh, it, the environment includes rats in the ghetto and public housing unworthy of its name. So my father's original call to action in 1970, 50 years ago, think about this, that call to action was one seen through this broader social justice lens that, frankly, the environmental community has only recently embraced, uh, um, uh, better late than never. Uh, but my, my father's call to action 50 years ago was multi-generational, it was bipartisan, and it was a social uh, justice lens through which he viewed the environment. And the environment wasn't just pristine places where uh, affluent uh, white-skinned people could escape to enjoy nature. It included the environments in the inner city. It included public housing unworthy of its name. and. I think it's uh, certainly a failing on the part of the environmental community that it took us so long to hear that part of his message. And I think we're, we're making great progress in that regard now, um, but we've got a lot of work to do. Tia, I wanted to ask because much of our current environmental policies were shaped and passed in the 1970s, um, uh, most notably, of course, the formation of the Environmental Protection Agency. And so much of the science that was available in the 70s uh, still is applicable to the laws that we have on the books some 50 years later. Um, but to even get any sort of environmental regulations passed, it required bipartisan approaches where the Republican uh, president, Richard Nixon, uh, was even amenable um, to, to signing off on such legislation to create laws that would guard our, our air and our water. So at that point, I mean, what do you think drove that bipartisanship that we really don't see today? We don't see the coming together of Republicans and Democrats to support the environment or to to support initiatives embracing clean air and water. It's viewed mostly as a democratic thing. Yes, and uh, which is unfortunate, right? Because regardless of your political persuasion or your uh, uh, how old you are or your economic standing, uh, we all need to breathe clean air and drink clean water to prosper, you know, and I think that the first Earth Day, is, uh, one of its uh, significant successes was that it brought the country together. Now, keep in mind, the country was very divided in 1970, divided over the war. Um, uh, there was a lot of uh, partisan uh, bickering. Uh, my father was on Richard Nixon's enemy list for his early opposition to the war. Uh, and yet, President Nixon 
uh, created the Environmental Protection Agency. More environmental laws were passed in the decade that followed the first Earth Day than any other time in American history. Congress adjourned on that day, and most every congressman, Democrat or Republican, went home to their district and participated in an Earth Day event. And uh, the Clean Air Act was adopted and the Clean Water Act was adopted. And uh, those are really significant, uh, noteworthy, and historically important milestones that the environment has, uh, that the issue of the environment has become politically divisive and partisan um, in the manner that it has it, it is a, a source of great. Um, um, great despair for me. Um, it's one of the reasons I thought it was so important to include Bob English's voice in uh, our film to look at the past, the present, and the future of the environmental movement um, uh, on the anniversary of uh, Earth Day. I have to believe that Republicans and progressives and Democrats uh, can come together in, in a common understanding that our economic well-being, uh, the well-being of the public health, uh, our rights to breathe clean air and drink clean water, uh, these no, no political boundaries. I puzzle a lot over how we've become so politically divided. I have my own theories. I don't think I'm... Um, smart or perhaps wise enough to, to really know the answer. I've got to believe that the Supreme Court uh, decision, Citizens United, played a significant role because of the um, dark money from, from uh, uh, special interests that was allowed to pour into political campaigns and, and, uh, and further uh, corrupt our democracy, uh, that that had a significant influence. So lastly, Tia, I, I want us to zoom in a bit on Wisconsin, a state where your father did go on to serve as governor. And to say that the politics of the state have been turbulent for the past 10 years or so is an understatement. And I know you know this very well uh, because you served as a member of the Board of Commissioners for Public Land. So how does a state which produced Gaylord Nelson or a Russ Feingold, both in the tradition of fighting Bob La Follette, and the progressive era in Wisconsin also produced polar opposites like Senator Joe McCarthy, Governor Scott Walker, and former majority leader Paul Ryan. What political forces have driven those changes and what's different in Wisconsin today than it was, say, a generation ago? Uh, the question you ask is an interesting one. Wisconsin does have a really long tradition uh, uh, as the home of uh, progressive political voices uh, going back 100 years. And uh, the answer to how we've changed and become a purple state, I think, is a complicated and, and uh, perhaps nuanced one. Uh, I think that there was a growing uh, resentment uh, and uh, distrust towards government that has occurred uh, uh, across the country that is not unique to Wisconsin. Uh, personally, I think that uh, the, uh, uh, gerrymandering of congressional and legislative districts played a significant role and uh, is eroding our sense of uh, and opportunity to, to be a robust uh, democracy. It's, and it's quite unfortunate whether you think of the Supreme Court Citizens United case or uh, the fact that we uh, in Wisconsin have the most gerrymandered state uh, uh, in the country. And um, uh, it's not um, uh, healthy. I, I, if you look at the election results. Uh, Tony Evers, our sitting governor, got 100,000 more votes than, than the Democrats, than, forgive me, than the Republicans uh, did in the legislature, yet the legislature picked up seats. How do you explain that? The math doesn't work, right? So uh, I, we are living in deeply troubling and challenging times in terms of the health and well-being of our democratic institutions. And it's everything from dark money to gerrymandering um, to the, to the, the, the um, uh, sort of corrosiveness uh, of our political culture at this time. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it was April 22nd, 1970, when millions of activists gathered to celebrate the earth and to make a stand in a statement regarding policies and actions needed to protect the earth and clean air and water. Today, we've been speaking with Tia Nelson. She is the managing director of the Outrider Foundation's climate program. She's also the daughter of the late Gaylord Nelson, who served as a senator and governor from the state of Wisconsin and who also served as a friend on earth-friendly policies while he was in leadership. Tia, we appreciate your time so much and thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you, I'm grateful. As are we, and thank you for watching The Real News Network. Thanks a lot for watching, appreciate it. Uh, but do us one more solemn favor, hit the subscribe button below. You know you want to. Stay up on the videos.